Well, in all the years that I've worked in production woodworking shops, including the Woodsmith production shop, one thing has always been in common. When it comes time to lay out complex curves and shapes, I always see people grabbing gallon paint cans or bending steel rulers and then yelling, hey Chris, come over here and strike this line for me. Well, the other day I was doing a project in here on an expensive piece of mahogany and I needed a large radius. And I finally found it. It was the rim of a 35 gallon white plastic trash can. Well, it worked, but after that I said, no more. So today on Basecamp, what are we doing? We are making furniture sized layout tools for the workshop. This episode is sponsored by Inventables. Design it, build it, sell it. Learn more at inventables.com. Well, the first tools that we're going to make today are going to be a series of three French curves. This is an example of one of them. Now, the three sizes are going to, be, going to give us a great variety of different curves, different shapes, different attributes, which I think will really be handy in the shop and we're going to cut them in a number of different sizes. So lots of choices. Now one of the things we need to decide up front is what material are we going to use to make these curves. What you see here is a piece of quarter inch extruded acrylic. And that's also what I have on my machine here, only this has a protective film on top of it, which is why it looks blue right now. The extruded acrylic is really fantastic. I love the clarity of being able to see through the plastic and see exactly what I'm doing as I position my tool and my work. It's tough, doesn't weigh too much. The only drawback is it's a little bit expensive, but these are tools that I want to make to last for years and years here in the Woodsmith production shop. A couple more choices. You may have laying around quarter inch plywood from some of your projects. This is a piece of Baltic birch. That light, pretty look will make a wonderful set of curves. If you'd like to class things up a little bit, here's a piece of walnut. So maybe you've got some hardwood plywood laying about. That'll really make for a wonderful set of curves for you. Another alternative that is probably the most cost effective and will work really well is quarter inch hardboard. So it's tempered both faces. One thing you might want to do to make the hardboard look a little better and make it last a little longer is to apply finish to both surfaces. Now it's rather porous and it's going to drink up a river of finish, but it will really make for a tough skin on this and make a great set of tools. Well, now that you've chosen the material that you want to use, it's time to think about what type of router bit is going to be best suited for it. Now I've got quarter inch extruded acrylic here, so I need to think about that. There's a couple of choices you can make when cutting plastics. One is whether to use a straight cutting bit or a spiral. Now a spiral bit for plastic has much of a, less of a curvature as the spiral bits are used to using for wood. This is a solid carbide spiral bit I have here, and this one has a ceramic coating on it. I'm starting to buy a lot of my router bits with ceramic coatings on them. Ceramic coatings have a lot of great attributes for CNC machines. The two that I like best are it hardens the edge and makes it last longer so your bit stays sharper and ceramic coatings help draw the heat away from that edge and that too will make it last much much longer. So after deciding whether you're going to use a straight bit or an upcut bit, a spiral, next thing we need to think about is how many flutes. Harder plastics respond better to two flutes. Softer, gummier plastics respond better to single flute bits. This extruded acrylic is kind of in between, but my experience is that a two flute bit will work very well. So what I've got chucked up in the machine is a bit kind of like this. Two flutes, solid carbide, spiral. So, let me talk a little bit about my cutting strategy. One thing I would like to avoid is having to lay out a lot of tabs along the edges of my workpiece. So what I'm going to do is have the machine make a series of pocket cuts 
to open up these interior spaces on all the French curves. Once it has done that, I'm going to take some small blocks of wood and screw them over those openings and that will clamp the material firmly to my spoil board. Once that's done, I can go ahead and have the machine do the profile cut, no tabs, and that's what I want. Well, we finished cutting our French curve, so let's see what we've got. Well, there we go, a French curve for furniture work in the workshop. I'm pleased with that. You know, there are a lot of different styles of French curves. I've got three of them which I've drawn out, and of course they're going to be available to you in DXF files. But if you go to the web, you're going to find dozens and dozens of different shapes. You choose whatever thing works best for your work. But this reverse Sima, I think that's a must-have. Well, with the French curves done, it's time for us to move on to circles. There are going to be three steps to create the circle templates. The first one is we're going to do some V-carving. The templates have numbers to designate the radius of each of the arcs. And so I've got a 30-degree V-bit in the machine. Once the V-carving is finished, I'm going to change out that bit for the bit we were using earlier, a quarter-inch spiral upcut for plastic. That bit will then cut all of the different arcs that will form the template. When that's finished, I'm going to do that little trick I did earlier with the French curves. I'll just take some pieces of hardboard and some screws and run those through the openings to securely hold everything in place, and then we'll proceed to a tab-free profile cut. And that'll finish up our circle templates. Well, there's one of our completed circle templates. Still a little bit of blue film to peel off. Now, there's actually two of these. In order to get a nice spacing and have increments of one inch from 5 to 22, I've created two templates, one with odd numbers and one with even numbers. So this is the odd template. And that gives you a lot of great choices. So put away your paint cans and your drywall buckets. Make these templates and that'll help you out with circles. Now that we're done with these, we're going to move on to do some more circle work. We're going to make a tr pair of trammels and we're also going to make a protractor. Our next step is to drill the holes in the trammels. And there's a lot of holes and they need to be accurate. They're also fairly small, they're eighth of an inch, just big enough to hold the end of a pencil. Now to drill all those holes, the way that I'm choosing to do it is to use a drilling function in the software that I have. The advantage of using a drilling function is that the machine will peck at the hole, the depth that I have in the parameter settings for the depth of cut for that bit. So in this case, I'm using an eighth inch bit and I've set about a 0.1 depth and it's going to cut that deep each time and retract. And the important thing is that it retracts because that's going to give us time to get the chips out of that hole. With plastic, they might otherwise overheat and bind and we would get a kind of an ugly gummy hole. So, the other thing that I'm going to do to ensure that those chips get out of that hole is that I'm using a single flute bit. For all the profile cuts and things we've done up to now in plastic, I've used a two flute bit because it works well in this extruded acrylic. But for drilling, I'm going to use a single flute bit. Well, it's time to cut out the profile for our trammels and the protractor. Well, I've got our two trammels cleaned up, so let's take a look at them. This one goes from 0 to 18 inches, and you can see there are four holes by each number, so those are each at a quarter inch increment. Using the trammel is simple. Just use a sharp pointed awl or a nail, 
in the one end, choose your increment. In this case, I'm going to choose 16 and a quarter and rotate. Makes a great tool. This is a larger size. This one goes all the way from 19 to 30 inches. So you've got a lot of choices there for different sizes of arcs and circles. Now, one thing about this set is that I did use tabs. The previous tools, I didn't want to because the pencil is going to be moving along the outside and inside edges of those, so I wanted it smooth. And I had inside cutouts in which I could attach hold downs. I didn't have that option here, and I'm not worried about any little lumps and bumps as the pencil is not going to be tracing around the outside. Removing the, diff the tools from the plastic is pretty simple, but you need to make sure that when you do, you don't fracture the plastic back into the tool itself. So I have the tabs on top of this protractor at the moment, and it's pretty simple to simply break it off, and you can see I still have the tabs extending out. Now, to remove the tabs, what you don't want to do is use any kind of mechanical or power method like a belt sander because that generates heat and that's bad news with plastic. I find the simplest thing, the best thing, is a coarse metal cutting file like this. It'll take those tabs off very quickly, very easily. Well, that completes this set of tools. So, on to the next. Well, our final tool is a classic. It's a compass. Set it to any size you want. This is going to be just a very basic shop compass. Nothing fancy, no shiny brass here. So I've got some wood set up. I've got 7 16 maple. We're going to do this in two steps. I have a 1 8 inch bit in the machine right now, and it's going to cut some pockets, which I'll explain about later, and then we'll switch over to a quarter inch bit, which will cut out the final profile. Well, here's our finished compass. You, as you can see, it couldn't be simpler. Two legs, I've got a quarter inch carriage bolt and a wing nut to join them tightly together. I ground down a piece of 3 16 drill rod for one leg. The other has a pencil and this is a 1024 eye bolt. And the reason I got that eye bolt was it has a 5 16 interior dimension and that's just correct for a pencil. There's a slight trough carved into the wood so that the pencil lies in it, and a little wing nut on the back. I think if I were to make another compass, I would probably make one that's 18 inches long, and then this one's a 12 inch, and that would be a great set for a workshop. Easy to make, no big deal to do, super handy. So, today we've made all sorts of great layout tools. We've got these big circle templates, odd, even numbers. We have two. Trammels, a different way to lay out circles. French curves, three different kinds. And with all these things, all you need to do with your DXF file is stretch it or shrink it and you'll get just the size you want. So I hope this helps you out in your shop. I think it's going to help us out a bunch and I don't ever intend to strike lines around drywall buckets, garbage cans, or paint cans again. So thanks so much for joining me today on CNC Base Camp and I hope you'll join us again next month for a new project and another episode. Well, we all want our CNC routers to be as accurate as possible. So one thing you do need to check is to see if the spindle or router is perpendicular with the work surface. Now, if you're using a spoil board, it's pretty easy to tell if it's out. If you look right here, You'll see all these lines from the last time I surfaced the spoil board. It feels like clapboard siding. Well, what that is, is that my bit is at an angle, and that's why it's creating all those steps. And it's at an angle because my spindle is cocked a little bit. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Now, it's easy to tell when using a spoil board when that's happening because you do get these lines. When they're on the right and the left of the spindle, it just means that the spindle is cocked a little bit like so. When you find them on the front and the back, that means the spindle or router is leaning either out or back. 
It's a little harder to tell if you're using a machine with the aluminum bed, but you can tell, and you can correct the problem. And we're going to correct the problem by using this very simple jig. It's a tramming jig. It's just a piece of one by two, about 12 inches long. I've got a machine screw on one end with the head, and on this end, I'm using the same machine screw, but I've cut the head off. So what we're going to do is chuck it into the machine. Once it's in place, I'm going to carefully lower my spindle until this bolt is just a little bit off the surface. All right, my trammel's in place, and I have it so it just drags on this side. Now I'm going to rotate it and see what happens. Well, it's rising up here. Oh boy, it's rising quite a bit over here. There's a large gap between it and the spoil board, and now towards the back. A little less, but there's still a gap. So what's that telling me? Well, it's telling me that my spindle is leaning quite a bit towards me, and it's leaning back a little bit. So how do we deal with that? Well, the manufacturer's recommendation for this unit is to ream these holes out a little bit, allowing it a bit of wiggle room, and that will take care of the right to left lean. And then I'll use paper shims behind the mounting block to lean it forward. So every machine is going to be a little bit different, but there should be a simple procedure you can do to make sure that your rattle or spindle is perpendicular to your work surface the whole way around. And the trammel is how you're going to find out, and the trammel is how you're going to solve the problem. So we all want the best out of our CNC machines, and this is an important thing you need to check, an important thing to take care of. This episode is sponsored by Inventables. Design it, build it, sell it. Learn more at inventables.com.